step into the enigma with Paranormal M. Subscribe, hit the notification bell. And if you think of it, hit the like button before you pass out and join us on our exploration of the unexplained. Buckle up for a mind-boggling adventure through the mysterious with our latest spine-tingling stories. We hope you're up for the challenge. Go on a try again. Third attempt. Anyone know what to call these? When I was about 10 or 12, my family was driving to visit my grandparents in another town. It's about 45 minutes, along the same roads that we always took. We traveled down country roads, mostly cornfields, the whole way. It's literally a left, then a right, for nearly 30 minutes, then left their home. Pretty much a straight shot, really. There's homes along the way, of course, and, well, this white house is kind of sad looking. A fence sort of falling down, paint peeling off, siding too. It's more grayish than white, really. The house is two stories. Square kind of thing. The lawn's not mowed on a regular basis. Rusty, crapped out looking vehicle in the driveway. As we're driving by it, I'm compelled to look at this house. Which I never really do. Usually I'm buried nose deep in a book. Every precious drive to my grandparents. Maybe give it a glance as we pass. If that. Anyways. The moment I look at the house, I'm slammed with a totally different reality. Instead of being in the vehicle with my family, I'm now inside the house. I'm cowering, trying to hide underneath the kitchen table. It has no tablecloth. A man is storming into the room, hollering about something. I can only see his legs, but he's a big type of guy. I watch this girl's leg frantically dash up the stairs. The doorway to the stairs is facing the narrow end of the kitchen table. The table's too close for me to see all the way up the stairs. The kitchen seems tiny. I can only see perhaps halfway up the stairs. She's like maybe 13, she's slightly older than me. The me in the car passing the house. But maybe older by a few years than me. The me under the table inside the house's kitchen. The man clashes up the stairs in a fury. He's close on the girl's heels. A lot of screaming and yelling is going on, but I can't make out any of the words. I see the legs all disappeared of sight for a moment, and a split second of terror-inducing silence. This was followed by thudding of a body tumbling down the stairs. The man's thrown the girl down the stairs. She falls below the bottom half, entering my line of sight. She makes eye contact with me. Her two braids are dangling down the sides of her face, disheveled, messed up. Her eyes plead with me to help. Then, suddenly, in a split instant, I'm back in my parents' vehicle, I have this sudden urge to shout, Stop! The girl there is hurt! As soon as this urge hits me, it's followed by a mental image of a gun. Note. Need to mention, I didn't act on my urge to shout out for help. I was scared by what happened. The mental image of the gun and the fact that my own family wouldn't have believed me. I still feel guilty about not saying that she needed help, though. 2. It's around Halloween time. Fox family is doing their annual countdown to Halloween shows and movies. We just switched from watching 2020 News, and I'm super looking forward to the Halloween witch-themed movie that's going to be on Fox Family. My mom's one of those people who always switches between two shows during commercial breaks in an attempt to watch two shows simultaneously. We briefly watched some segment of a commercial about Salem witch trials. It's like a documentary. I'm nearly 14 here, by the way. I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor directly in front of the TV. Suddenly, I'm no longer sitting in my parents' living room. I'm 18 years old with red hair braided in bangs. I'm wearing a dress similar to what you would see in a period-clad reenactment of like the early 1700s. 
a crowd is formed around a platform, the one from where the witch is to be hung. I'm hit with an immensely heavy feeling of sadness, and yet I cannot allow the sadness to show if I don't wish to be in danger too. I push my way through the crowd, gently nudging gentlemen and elders out of my way with a polite demeanor, pushing perhaps a bit more roughly than I intended. Push them out of the way. They're roughly my age and heeding no mind to the children jostling the crowd. I manage to nudge my way toward the front, stopping about two rows people deep from the very front of the crowd. I position myself behind two other ladies, one with thirty blonde braids that are twisted into a bun, and another with black hair, slightly wavy. It's underneath some kind of a bonnet or some kind of head covering. In parentheses, not a hat. The left half of my body is aligned directly behind the blonde. My right is aligned behind the black-haired lady. The blonde is 19 and the other is 22 or 23. We all share the sadness at the misfortune of the witch, yet we all must uphold the image of rage, indignant righteousness, the pride in seeing justice served to this witch who has betrayed us and harmed our community, family, and friends. We know it's wrong, and the weight of our sadness is felt keenly among the three of us, yet we hold no power to stop this tragedy. We cannot acknowledge our pain. I gently squeeze the shoulder of the blonde and nudge the black-haired woman in the small of her back in an attempt to give comfort. We don't acknowledge one another, but we stand to witness our friend's memory, lest her death shall be in vain. I'm sitting on the floor in front of the TV, blinking my eyes and glance around at my family members to see if they've noticed I've been gone. But I guess I wasn't gone, I'm still there, even though I was gone for what felt like half an hour. Maybe only a minute or two has actually passed. I'm super confused. I feel like crying tears of immense sadness, anger, and pain. Nobody in my family realizes something is amiss. I sit in confusion throughout the entire movie. I go to the bathroom during the next commercial to stare at myself in the mirror, to reassure myself that I'm not actually a redhead and that I don't have bangs. Three. I'm vaguely flipping through channels, finally settling on the History Channel. I'm watching some black and white reenactment of, like, the Battle of Gettysburg or something. Suddenly I'm a nameless, personless set of eyes watching a woman and two girls. Early teens, each are hanging from a noose. Their feet are dangling lifeless beneath the hems of their dresses, swaying ever so gently, even though there's no breeze. Almost as if they've been dead only shortly, but not long enough for them to be entirely still. This one was very sudden. It's as if the second I'm there and then I wasn't. There was someone watching these poor souls dangling lifelessly from their nooses. But I'm there so briefly and then gone. Barely have time to register details of myself in relation. Four. My son's almost one. It's the night before his first birthday. I felt uneasy ever since he was born living in the house that I do with his dad and his grandparents. It shouldn't be made, well, shouldn't have made me uneasy. The house and the land are new constructions. I'm anticipating the celebration of his birthday, complete with a cake made in the likeness of his favorite Sesame Street character. Wonder which one. I've put him to sleep in his crib, which is wedged between the wall and our bed. If he were to climb out successfully, he's likely to tumble onto me. Two sides are against the wall, one's against the bed, and the fourth side, the short width of the crib. It's the only one that allows a direct fall to the floor. I always sleep with my arm through the slats, the little fingers wrapped around one of mine. I do this so I know that he's, you know, if he's waking up or if he's crying. I wake the moment he lets go of my finger. In the middle of the night, I'm awoken with a groggy sense of confusion. Immediately, I peer into the crib to check on him, 
is not clutching my finger. I see him standing at the foot of his crib, awake and reaching for me. I'm fully awake now, looking at my son. I'm thinking that he just wants to be held, like he does from time to time. I reach out to him, encouraging him to come toward me, and he does. But something's not quite right. My son doesn't move that fluidly, and I glance down at the other end of the crib. Terror is rising inside of me. My son is sleeping. At the moment I register this fact, the thing at the other end of the crib becomes full of fury and desperation and jealousy. He tries to reach me before I grab my son. I snatch my son up, snarl at the thing. You are my child. Get away. The instant I have my precious son safe in my arms, the thing vanishes. It's in that moment I realize that thing didn't have feet. Simply a bit of space. Empty space existed where the feet should have been. It isn't yet midnight. I sense the risk is not yet over. I flee the room because I need to get into direct moonlight for a bit of protection. Nuts. I have no idea why this thought pops into my head. I don't question it, so I bolt and wander through the house searching for a window spot under direct moonlight. The window in the corner of the living room offers direct moonlight. I settle into the corner of the room, cradling my son in my arms. I was whispering with sort of chant and prayer that pops into my head. I say it three times. Make sure to stay within the moonbeams until early morning. As the sky lightens, I fall asleep, holding my child, certain that I've narrowly escaped some horrible thing happening. My son's grandparents are confused to find me the next morning, I'm sleeping in a sitting position with my son in the corner of the living room. The only thing I'm certain of is that the thing was both full of jealousy and desperation, almost like that it's had its chance with that night. It needed something from me before my son turned one. Like once my son was officially one, it was out of chances, and also I feel certain that it couldn't get what it wanted during daytime. Note, I no longer live in that house, and I have some disturbing stories from that neighborhood and its grandparents in that time since. I'm not wholly sure what the thing was, but it mimicked my child almost perfectly, with the exception of my child's movement. It looked exactly like my son, right down to the individual strands of hair and the clothing he was sleeping in. I fear what would have happened if I'd not been fully awake. Or maybe I hadn't been in the habit of waking the moment my child let go of my finger. Five. I've just bought and moved into my first home. Still getting to know the roads in my neighborhood. Still getting confused on exactly which street I am to turn on to navigate through the older subdivision I now call my home. It's not like the cookie-cutter newer ones that you see today. My son is now a toddler, and he's in the car seat in the back seat of my car. I'm driving, almost at the stop sign at which I turn left to go home. As I'm slowing down to a stop, reality shifts. I'm a Native American boy, 12 years old, wandering through a wooded area. It's not densely forested, but spread out. It's lightly wooded. The ground is soft and damp following a slightly muddied, slightly dried dirt trail. The trail is not often used, but used often enough that about six inches in width is barren of newly growing plant life. It's a sunny day. The light is flickering through the trees and leaves. I'm wandering in search of something. I need to find myself and who I am. And the nature's silence, which is entirely quiet, is comforting. I know I'll eventually find myself, but I'm taking comfort in this journey. A sense of calm seriousness permeates each step I take. I'm at once entirely familiar with this stretch of land. I know each branch, tree, rock, pebble, and stone. Almost as much as I know each crease and fold in my skin. Each bit of my body and its movements, each intimate thought in my head. And just like that, I'm back behind the steering wheel of my car, 
sitting at a stop sign, my toddler babbling away happily in the back seat. The only confusion and discomfort I feel with this one is not that I was somewhere else, but that there's a lingering of the trees around me where houses should be. The scenery is kind of exactly as what I, the boy, was seeing, with the exception of the stop sign being real, and everything inside my car is real. But the landscape outside isn't the neighborhood in which I live, but rather the one through which I, the boy, was wandering. It's almost like two different landscapes from two different times failed to separate completely. Yet I feel strongly that both places are the same. Just that maybe they existed at two different times. It takes me a few moments before the landscape around me switches back to the neighborhood houses and cars that it actually is. Note. I strongly feel that I had, well, if I didn't have my son and ties to my life now, at the time this reality shift to where I am this Native American boy would have lasted a little bit longer. My only fear was that as a boy, my son didn't exist because he doesn't exist at that time. I didn't know what was happening with me, my car, my son while I was, you know, the boy. Confusing, I know. 6. After moving into my house, Whenever I was using the bathroom or showering, I would close the bathroom door. Every time without fail, the door would gently swing open. That was while I was on the other toilet or the shower. At first, I just assumed that I failed to shut the door completely, or that my son, a toddler at the time, was opening it. When it started happening while I was the only one home or my child was asleep, I began to feel that something wasn't quite right. I never felt threatened, just annoyed started to get out of the shower to reclose the door only to have it swing open again. I checked that door and it was firmly shut. I would tug on the knob a few times before getting into the shower. Each time the door would gently swing open to my dismay. I knew the house had previously been owned by an older woman who had been moving into a nursing home. It had been vacant for some time when I bought it. Beyond that... I really didn't know much about who lived here prior to me. So I started asking neighbors, got bits and pieces of the home's history. I was informed that it was owned by a couple who built the house after their children had grown and moved on, and that the husband had passed prior to the wife, who was still alive when I bought the house. No child had ever lived in my home, till my son and that it had originally been located a few streets over from where it currently sits. I'm the second owner of the home, as the couple who built it lived here, and I had purchased it from the wife, through my daughter and the POA. There was a bit of discrepancy over when exactly the husband had passed. I'd heard ten years prior to my purchasing the house, to two to three years prior to the lady being moved to a nursing home. After thinking over why the bathroom door always opened, and why it never did, so if my boyfriend was home, it always opened when it was just me, or me and my son. It never opened on me if anybody else was in the house. I puzzled over this, like, couldn't figure it out. Finally mentioned this to my boyfriend, he jokingly said I must have having a lovesick ghost following me around, and laughed it off. But the more I thought about it, the more I wondered if it was indeed a ghost or a spirit. I never felt threatened or uncomfortable, I just didn't know what to make of it. So one day I'm showering while my boyfriend's out with the sun. The door gently swings open. I step out of the shower, go close it, and once I assure it's tightly shut, I climb back in. But curiosity gets a hold of me. I keep my head poking out from the shower, eyes trained on the door to see if it opens again. Then a few minutes, sure enough, the door gently swings open again. Exasperated and slightly annoyed. And I say the following. Your wife isn't dead, she's still alive, but lives in a nursing home now. I just want to shower without the door opening, please. I bought this home and I live here now with my boyfriend and our child. Your wife lives in a nursing home now. And the door has never swung open since.
sorry to make you crap your pants. So I was 11, at least when this happened. I was staying at my father's house and he lived in a shared community home. They gave him the attic. It was a great size and had a jacuzzi in the bathroom. Nice. Now, this is in Malden, Massachusetts. This house is very old, and I mean very old. Everything creaks when you step on it. The windows have fancy old locks in the attic. It was the only room in the entire house with such locks. My parents had just divorced recently. My dad moved here to have his own place temporarily, till he could afford a place of his own that wasn't shared. And he did end up getting his own house. He normally went to work early around 9 a.m. I was left in there by myself. I really wasn't scared of doing so. Now, my father had been interested in witchcraft. He considered himself a white witch. I was fine with it as long as he was happy. Before he left for work, we went into a closed closet and shut the door. I heard him cast his spells or whatever, I don't fucking know. But it was like in a mumble. He brought a miniaturized pan with a candle inside of it with him. Thought nothing of it until he left for work. Strange things started happening the minute he left. Bathroom door randomly closed. Now we know what you're thinking. Old house equals drafts that may close it. No, sir. This door had a doorstop underneath it, and I know it did prior to it closing because I had just put it there. Since he had already left, and he was there to move it, but huh, I don't know. But I was like, whatever. Slid it back under the door. But the minute I did so, I heard a creak over by the dining room table. Now this attic isn't that spacious, but it's a great distance between the table and the bathroom. Still, I thought nothing of it. I carried on as usual, playing Xbox 360 for a few hours. He gets home late, around 11, and now it's about 7 o'clock-ish. It just got dark very quickly, had the light of the TV and ceiling light to keep me sane. But oh fuck, the power goes out on the whole block. I look outside, not a street lamp on at all. Now it's pitch black outside, and the only light is the moonlight. I'm fucking scared shitless. Then the bathroom door closes again. No draft. I put the door stop under it and it still closes. But this time it didn't sound soft. It was a light slam. As if somebody had pushed it shut. And I swear to God it felt as though not one or two but three people were standing near me. Goosebumps hit. I swear I could hear a light whisper coming from the closet. I'm almost to the point of crying when the power cuts back on and all the doors in the room swing open with force. In the corner of the room, a tall, shadowy figure with a somewhat church-looking hat stood. Tears fill my eyes. The fucking thing turns around to reveal a Moses parting the Red Sea-wide smile. But that's the thing no other features beside a smile. That's all I could remember before I fainted. My father came home and cussed me out for having all the lights on. I was still just so confused. I never stepped foot in that house again. Luckily, I was leaving the next day. My little sister saw the shadow man. I just got home from a deployment overseas. The first stop I made was to my dad's to see my little siblings. My sister's five, my brother's three, and my second sister's almost a year now. They live in Lowell. It's a quiet neighborhood far from the old house that my dad used to live in. Everything and everyone was pretty normal as I remember. My sisters share a room and my brother has his. However, they all sleep in one room when it's time for bed. I sleep in my brother's room when I come over. So one night I'm playing around with all of them, trying to be a good big brother. 
That's when my sister, who's five years old, asks me, Who is that? What are you talking about, Micah? She points toward the door to the hallway, which is open and shows the long hallway to the other room. Confused as I was, I said there's nobody there. She continues staring down the hallway. I ignore it, figuring it to just be her imagination at work. But here is the question that made my hair stand up. Why is he wearing that hat? Frustrated at this point, I get up and walk down the hallway. I look around, telling her there's nobody here. My dad walks upstairs, and my other sister begins crying from the other room. I return to Micah and my little brother. She's still staring down the hallway. She looks over at me and says, I don't think he likes you. Why doesn't he like me? I respond. Because he can't get you anymore. Now at this point I'm fucking anxious. Could she be seeing what I saw a decade ago? After this point she stops speaking of this figure, returns to playing as normal. I ask her about it later and she says, I don't know what you're talking about. Definitely weird. And why couldn't my little brother also see what she was talking about since he was right there with us? Any information on the shadow man that anybody has would be nice to hear. The Thing in My House So I live in a pretty old house. It's about 80 years old. The house beside me is actually the oldest house in my town. I believe it's over 200 years old, or at least close to it. I barely have any encounters in my house. But I do know something dwells inside. Whether it's a spirit or what, I don't know. My first experience with it was when I was about 16. I remember being in my room watching TV. Then I was called to eat supper, so... I got up, went in the kitchen, fixed my food, and walked back into my room. But as soon as I opened the door to my room and took a few steps, I hit what it felt like a wall, spilled my food everywhere, knocked me back a little. I was horrified to see that I literally ran into nothing. I could see, but there was something definitely there, just maybe it was invisible. I stood there dazed and terrified. I couldn't move because I was too scared to. But I eventually stuck my hand out to see if it was still there. There was nothing. So I cleaned everything up, went back to get more food, stuck my hand out in case it happened again. But it was fine, so I sat down and ate. Nothing happened again for a while. I never told anybody because it was so stupid nobody would believe me. I do. My second encounter didn't happen for years and years later, but it was while I was sleeping. I was laying in bed trying to go to sleep when I heard what sounded like scratches coming from within my mattress. It didn't bother me, but it did confuse me because I thought it could be maybe a mouse. I just wasn't sure how it got in my mattress. Then I began to hear it in the walls, which again didn't faze me, just thought it was a mouse. But as I was laying there, I felt a tug. It was above my head. I sleep with the blanket over my head. It just feels more comfortable to me. It still didn't faze me. I thought it was just from maybe a blowing of the fan, but then the next tug literally took the blanket off my head. I got jumped out of my bed fast. I turned my fucking light on. I thought it was a mouse still. I was pulling the blanket with like its teeth or something. I looked everywhere, but I couldn't find anything, and the scratching stopped as well. So I laid my head back down and fell asleep. Nothing ever happened again. I'm not sure what it is or what it wants, but I believe it likes to mess with me every once in a blue moon. And honestly, that's completely fine with me, as long as it never gets worse. Old house still gives me the chills. 
Around 2011, my older cousin bought a small two-bedroom single house in a quiet neighborhood for retired folks. The house was very small with only 850 square feet of interior space. But it sat on a large plot of land. We could have easily fit two more houses like it, but it'd still be nice to have leftover space for yards and gardening. I was still a college student at the time. I lived with my cousin. When he bought the house, I moved in with him. There were the two of us living there. According to the real estate agent, the house had been abandoned for around three years. The previous owner basically left it unmaintained and moved to a different state. The house had one main floor and a small attic and an unfinished basement. The first time we walked in, the floorboard was already rotted out. We could see the basement through it. Everything was in horrible condition and we'd have to do major restoration to make it livable again. The property also had a small storage shed in the back of the lot. My cousin got a great offer, so we took the deal without much hesitation. Weird things started to happen when we began our restoration work. One day we were working on the bathroom. My cousin told me he had to go Home Depot and get some stuff. So we left. I heard him open the front door, go outside, and close it. He turned on his car and actually drove away. I was taking apart the old boards that were nailed on the bathroom walls. My back was facing the bathroom door. Five minutes after my cousin left, the bathroom door, which was open, started to slowly move to a closed position. I knew that because I could hear the creaky old door sound that it made. I turned around and saw the door continue to close on its own. Then it stopped as it touched the door frame, bounced back a little. I thought maybe it was just the wind. Then suddenly the door pulled itself shut tightly, as if there was somebody on the other side of the door pulling it. It happened right in front of my eyes. I was only four feet away from it, after all. No wind could have done that. Plus, all the windows were closed around the house, so there couldn't possibly be any wind. You might think that maybe the A.C. caused it. Nope. This old house didn't have central A.C. We had to put in a window A.C. unit afterwards. At this point, I thought my cousin was messing with me. So I called out to him. There was no response and there was only silence. I opened the door, continued to call for him, telling him to stop joking around. My cousin was not there. I checked the parking lot. He was gone. I even got outside and did a perimeter check. No one was there. I still can't explain what happened. After the reservoir... Excuse me. After the restoration was done, we moved in. My cousin sometimes went on business trips for weeks and there would just be me in the house. The following happened whenever I was alone in the house. One night I was studying. I had headphones on. I heard sounds of somebody walking around in the basement. It was directly below my bedroom. It sounded like they had slippers on and I could sort of hear the sounds of the slippers dragging on the concrete floor in each step. What's weird was that I couldn't pinpoint exactly which direction it was coming from. It's a strange sensation that the sounds were coming from the back of my own head, like right behind me. The only reason that made me think it's from the basement was because the basement was the only area in the house that had concrete. At least, concrete floors that, you know, could make concrete slipper dragging sounds. I took out my headphones. The sounds of footsteps still went on. The volume of the sound stayed about the same, with or without headphones. But my cousin had come home early, so I called out to him, got no reply. I took the flashlight and went to the basement to check it out. It was dark and quiet. No, my cousin had not come home, and no one else was there either. This happened like three or four more times than the first two months I lived in that house. After that, I didn't experience anything unusual anymore. My cousin never felt or seen anything weird, but he seemed interested in my stories. His girlfriend and now wife, who had been in the house every other week or so, also expressed her uneasy feelings during her stays. 
by 2016 during a thunderstorm. The thunder struck our storage unit in the backyard and burned everything inside it. Luckily, the house was untouched. I came home from work only to find a police officer waiting in the front. That was a quick front. He told me what had happened, and he said it's an act of God, and our homeowner's insurance would compensate for the loss. In our Asian culture, people say that when thunder strikes somewhere, often it is to strike down a malevolent force or spirit. We quickly came to a realization that this thunder strike was more than just an accident. I got my own place and moved out a few months after the fire. My cousin bought another house with his wife a year after that. He still owns the creepy house and it's been left unoccupied since 2017. He plans to tear down the old house and build a larger one to take advantage of the large plot of land. In parentheses, real. Scariest inception like nightmare I've ever had. My family is of a French religion that believes in the after death and in contacting them. My grandfather and my father say that they can see or hear things. I myself have been a skeptic for a long time, but strange things have been happening for some time that make me question my beliefs. First thing, my ex-girlfriend and I were in the living room watching a movie at dawn. That's when suddenly I see a shadow figure out of the corner of my eye going down the stairs that lead to my living room where we were. I, doubting the veracity of what I'd seen, decide to don't care. Soon after, my ex asks me, Did you see that? I answer, Yeah. Summarizing the progress, we both saw the figure. We were afraid and went up to the room. Second thing, dreaming with the dead. I've had a few dreams with deceased people that I knew were talking to me. My father says it's my way of getting in touch with them. But as I said, I'm quite skeptical. Third thing, sleep paralysis. I have had sleep paralysis my whole life, but the last few of them have been dark. Example. Me and a cousin broke into an abandoned factory, and on the same day I had sleep paralysis where I could hear voices saying, We shouldn't have gone there. My cousin also on the same night heard footsteps and knocks on the door of the isolated house where he lives in. I've had other bad experiences with sleep paralysis, which according to my father are caused by an obsessive spirit. And it tries to torment me, but none as horrible as the one I'm about to tell you. This happened today. I went to bed around 1 a.m. I woke up around 4 p.m., or excuse me, a.m., and I was hungry. I go down to the kitchen, drink some yogurt, drink, and I eat a cookie. I go up again to my room. I lie down and fall asleep, but not quiet. I stay awake half asleep with the fucking sleep paralysis. In front of me, next to my bed, I see a figure's head moving frantically, like we see in horror movies. Serious shit. I wake up, or at least I think I wake up. I sit on the bed, but something's wrong. I feel a strange presence in the room, and I run to the bedroom door, but I don't really get there. I wake up again. This time, seeing a black arch on my bedroom ceiling. Inside the nightmare, I try to leave my room and go to my father's room. My parents sleep in separate rooms. When I get there, I open the door, and he's asleep. I try to wake him up, but he doesn't. I wake up again, suspecting that I'm still in the dream, but I'm totally confused. I get up from the bed and walk over to my bedroom door. Halfway there, I feel a presence behind me. I look back, and it is me except with a demonic smile on my face. I wake up again. I run to my mom's room, scared to death. She's sleeping, but wakes up. I tell her that I was having nightmares. I asked to sleep next to her. 
I'm an adult man, so imagine the fear I was about, ask to sleep next to her. I lie down, she starts laughing, viciously. I get chills, but I'm not an easy guy to scare. I look at my mother, and she has the same smile as me in my previous dream, laughing as if enjoying my suffering. I get angry, and I ask that if he's tormenting me. I grab the thing, that's both my mom and a thing, by the neck with anger, and I choke her. I wake up again, this time to have another paralysis, within the ordinary this time. Then I really wake up, glad to really be awake this time. Haunting sing-song demon. I'm 22 and male. I used to have sleep paralysis almost every night, and as vivid as some of those times were, the demon its voice and garbled language. The thing that freaked me out the most is that I never had sleep paralysis on a night that my dog slept in my room. Not once. I spent lockdown alone, and one night... I had sleep paralysis. It was the first time in a long time. I woke to being paralyzed in my room on the second floor. I looked around my room as far as my eyes would allow. Everything was normal. My lava lamp I left on was rising and falling. A breeze was blowing through the open window, causing the blind to gently knock against the frame. I sleep with my bedroom door open habit I picked up when I lived on a boat for a few years. I just got used to very little privacy. Just feels more normal to me. Having the door open, I hear everything in the flat. I always wake if there's a sound out of the ordinary. Another sailing thing. After a few seconds, I hear the door rattling downstairs on the ground floor. The door into my house. My first thought is that somebody's breaking in and I'm fucking paralyzed at the moment. I start to freak out. More so than the normal being on edge because of the sleep paralysis. That's when I hear the door swing open forcefully and then slowly fall back onto the latch. It is then pushed and clicked back into being shut. My heart drops out of my ass at this point. But it doesn't get any better from here. An adult male voice that's mockingly high-pitched like a grown man pretending to be a young child. It's like in a sort of nursery sing-song melody. It jeers us up the stairs, clearly and loudly. You weren't scared before I got here, but can't move now I'm near. You're a sticky stuck with fear and glue, now hear me come to find you. I tried. Immediately after it finished taunting me, I began to run up the stairs. It sounded like two steps at a time and was heavy and fast. I heard each loud thud, the floorboards creak with pressure and bounce back when released. I heard it make it to the landing and run around to the second set of stairs. Thud, creak, release. Thud, creak, release. Thud, creak, release. Just when it should have made it to my doorway, I could move shot up and out of my bed with my heart racing, ready for whatever my fate was to be. Nothing came through. I had a good search around the flat, locked the door to my flat. It wasn't previously locked as the door to the street, and I basically trust my neighbor not to kill me in my sleep. Basically, I went back to sleep. Basically. I tried to stay awake, but I was extremely tired and kept drifting off. The rhyme was honestly terrifying and very new, but since I used to have sleep paralysis regularly, I started writing a lot of poetry. So I explain away the song that way. Still creeps me the hell out, though. Not my most visual sleep paralysis by any stretch, but the most terrifying and the most audibly vivid by far. Don't mess with the Ouija board. It was the year 2010. 
And for some reason, my friends were always talking about using a Ouija board. And if one of us finds one, grab it. At the time the mall closed, and we had like a Spencer's. I saw a Ouija board for sale. I bought it and invited my friend to come over. We were both skeptical. I trusted her. So we went to my dorm room and I decided to play. So we set it up on a makeshift table in the middle of the room and started off. Ouija, Ouija, are you there? The board pointed to yes on the board. I look at my friend. Did you do that? She looks at me. No, why would I? Expletive. Do you think? Are you expletive with me, grumpy? I looked at her and said, uh, no. So we go back to ask. Are you from the sun or from the moon? The pointer points to moon, and it just feels nasty in there. But again, me being skeptical, I thought my friend was messing with me and continued on. What's your name? It didn't answer. So I ask it what it wants. And then, it moved violently and quickly. Spells out my friend's name. I look at her and she's trembling and scared shitless. Yells at just for me to stop. I tell her I'm not doing shit. She must be. Both of us are panicking. I ask it one last question. How? K-I-L-L-Y-O-U. My name was spelled. Then the room and shit falls off the wall. I thought I ended and said goodbye, but my friend wouldn't touch it. Never got an answer back. The next day I drove as fast as I could to return that board. Nope, not doing it. Usually Spencer's has a no return, but clearly shaken up the manager approved it and I left. Paranormal Activity 2 came out this year, and I decided to go see it with a group of my friends. After I take everybody home and head back home, I'm heading to my dorm room and my vehicle stalls on a railroad crossing. Yep, no reason, just stalls. At this point, I'd gotten it and there's no mechanical issues. It just won't start. Finally, I get it to restart and Highway to Hell blasts through the radio. And out of nowhere, a train is coming. Fuck, no, 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 move, move! My seatbelt stuck. My vehicle won't move, and there's, well, there's nowhere my vehicle finally moved. I can control the radio again. Rather than go back to my dorm room alone, I drive to my mom and dad's house and stay there until morning. I wish that was the end of it, but it isn't. 2011. I end up having to move back with my parents due to some financial struggles. I was trying to help raise my nephew, so I help out a bit too. From 2011 to 2014, I would experience episodes of a cross in a bedroom being turned upside down. I would have intense suicidal thoughts. One night, a friend of mine decided to come over. We would have stayed at my place, except the cross kept turning around. Thought it was my sister and her friends messing with me until I saw the cross move all by itself. At this point, I knew I needed to get as far as I could from this place, and fast. 2014. Until now, I haven't had any encounters. I don't know what it was, it just... I knew that it scared me to death. And I'll never forget the fear. I also try to avoid railroad tracks. To this day, my parents and friends say I'm crazy. But I experienced what I experienced. I'll never touch another Ouija board. Yeah, I have my own stories as well. They are too much. And sorry if you guys can hear the fan going, but I am sweating like crazy. It's like 110 degrees. And I had too much coffee. Moving on. I got chased by a satanic cult when I was a teenager. 
I got chased by a satanic cult once when I was a teenager running around at 2 a.m. with my friend. But that was near population. I've run across ritual locations where wherever they've summoned wanted an offering from me, way out in the Sierras. Due to requests for clarification, tad bit of background, I grew up on a hill, only a good 300 foot tall one. To the east of the Silicon Valley, by the way. You could see the valley looking west and a large lake looking east, with no roads or anything all the way to Highway 5. A rich dude purchased the land for a golf course and a country club. This was about a quarter mile from my home. It was one of the kinds with a tennis court golfing, several pools and a hot tub. Five yurt round type buildings with different functions, weightlifting, aerobics, party spot, etc. Then there was maybe a 10k foot building down a bit further past the last swimming pool, weddings, events, whatever. We at a certain point began calling it Motel Hell. This was when I was around five. We went there a lot. At some point the developer decided to abandon it. Pools turned green and then dried up. We were in our early teenage years at this point. Running about toilet papering neighbors running around in the middle of the night as we were invincible. We would shoot flare guns at cops. Doing things that would get you thrown in jail as terrorists these days. Sad that things have changed. I agree. We had seen the ritual drawings and such in various locations around the place. Learned about some of them from the library. When we would go into a 10k foot party location, there would be large drawings on the floor and walls. We would all notice that even if it was 100 degrees outside, huh, it would be cold almost to seeing your breath. We knew people were there at night. Our bus stop was in the parking lot. We would spend mornings breaking the many hundreds of bottles left sitting around by older teenagers at night. My friend's house, which was just over from the driving range, he moved in, could see invisible writing on his walls at certain times of the day. Invisible ink creating a ritual space for magic and not good stuff. He had some difficult times. I witnessed much weird shit. Anyway, we were out running around at about 2 a.m. one Friday. We could see lights in the club, decided to sneak up and around through the golf course from the back. There were more bushes and trees there. We crept up, got into earshot and sight, saw them performing rituals. After a few minutes observing them, one suddenly turned in his robes and pointed out into the dark toward us. Not sure what he said, they all sprinted out into the dark toward us. Not like they could catch us, but they tried for a good hour. The other one was a witch's dealio. I ran across fishing in the High Sierras near Camp High Sierra in the Boy Scout camp. The Adder Man. Something is attached to me. I'm a 30-year-old father of three. This all started in 2009 or so when my eldest daughter was very young. There had been a snowstorm and a few of my friends were trapped at the house. My girlfriend, my daughter, and my brother and I shared it. Out of the people who were there, the only believers in the group were me and my brother. My daughter was sitting in her high chair eating dinner when she suddenly looked down the long hallway to the utility room from the living room. She stopped eating, locked in a silent scream, slapped all of her food off the high chair. I removed her from the seat as fast as I could and handed her off to her mom. My brother, my friend, and I stood in the doorway blocking whatever may be from the girls. At this point, the air was buzzing. Something felt very strange. Then my daughter finally takes a breath and starts screaming, Adderman, Adderman, Adderman! We of course all bristle up at this point because she doesn't really speak a lot, especially at this age. Finally, the energy in the room goes down. 
After this, some other occurrences did happen. But it's a lot, and I'd hate to type it out for people to not even read it. I'm not a writer, so I apologize if this is a mess. The reason I'm writing now is that somewhat near a decade later, and now my youngest daughters are around the same age as my oldest was at the time that she was saying a lot of things like that to me were happening at the same time. The Adder Man. Full write-up. During the winter of 2009, there was a big snowstorm that hit my small Oklahoma town. If you know how the southern states deal with snow, you understand that this is a big deal. The snowstorm knocked out the power, and this was over a period of like a few days. This instant happened when the storm first hit. My brother, my girlfriend at the time, and a couple of friends and I had pretty much been snowed in. The power was hanging in there. I had made my daughter some chicken nuggets for dinner. She was sitting in her high chair and eating them. She had been eating for a few minutes, and that's when she stiffened in a silent scream and stared into a long hall that reached the length of my house. Instantly, the energy in the house had changed. There was almost a buzzing in the air. My friend, my brother, and I jumped up and put ourselves between the girls and whatever had scared my daughter like this. Deja vu. After she saw something, she trashed her chicken nuggets off the high chair, trying to get out, so my then-girlfriend grabbed her. We could all feel something was looking at us. We assumed maybe somebody had walked through the back door at the end of the hall. We couldn't see anything. Then my daughter started to scream and cry, Adderman, over and over. The friend that was there was a skeptic. He didn't believe in anything paranormal until this instant. The buzz in the air finally died down. We asked my daughter about what she saw. The best she could tell us through baby talk was that it looked like daddy with long wet hair like mommy. Obviously, it wasn't this clear. But I'm translating from toddler to little. So, this was the start. A few days after my daughter started having nightmares about what she would call the blue eyes, the best we could gather was that there was a group of kids, and all of them could see, or rather, all they could see was their blue eyes. One night I woke up from a dead sleep. I saw someone standing behind my fan. They were kind of hunched over, looking between the blades. Then I suddenly heard my daughter start crying at the top of her lungs. The figure dusted away. I used the word dusted because it was like the person just came apart. Normally I would assume this was a lucid dream or something, but my daughter happened to cry in the middle of it. I jumped up to check on her, and as soon as she saw me, she said, the blue-eyed made the baby on fire. This is word for word, minus the baby talk. At this point, I reached out to a family friend. She made me a bag to sew into my daughter's teddy bear, and I did. My daughter's nightmare stopped, and we didn't have any more related incidents. Myself and the girlfriend broke up a few years later. I moved to Texas, had some roommates, but only had visitation with my daughter. Nothing that happened ever really seemed as if it was related to the earlier incidents, so I pretty much forgot about it. In this house in Texas, I started having issues with sleep paralysis. I would occasionally wake up and see a big pair of chattering teeth in my closet, wouldn't be able to move, but I would eventually doze back off. I said to someone in the comments that it never bothered my stepson or me speaking about it to my wife. She thinks she may have seen it. A few years after the sleep paralysis, my wife and my stepson came into my life. My stepson would often have nightmares, but one night he complained of being scared to sleep. This is normal because he's only three. We asked him why, and he told us, there are scary teeth in my closet. Not necessarily related, but worth mentioning. Years after that, we haven't been, well, excuse me, years after that, 
we now have a three-year-old little girl. She was very smart and advanced pretty fast with her speech, so she was pretty much understandable, and that was just before her second birthday. She always had issues with sleep. She started telling her things about a baby scaring her when she was sleeping. A little while later, she started talking to us about random things. She's riding her car seat one day and tells us that she saw me last night. But I was a spirit. She starts referring to the spirit as Spirit Daddy. Apparently, she follows Spirit Daddy around the house, and he and his friends with blue eyes go into each of her siblings' room and jump and play. They crawl on the walls and play in the bed, then go to the next room and do the same thing. Then they run and hide until the next time. So two of my children have described to me the same kind of spirit with long hair coming and interacting with them. The spirit daddy also apparently has friends that have blue eyes and are kids. For the record, this isn't like a family legend that we're talking about. After the first occurrence, there was a kind of hush order on the Adderman. We didn't want repeats or kids to have nightmares when they were older. I need help from you guys, and I believe this is all true, and I've spent the entire day searching for answers to this problem. Let's help him out. So, some of these things have only just come up recently. One of them being consistent nightmares and manipulation of objects. So first off, roughly 11 p.m. almost every night, something quickly runs along the deck outside approaching my window. And only if even a single light is on, it hits the window very hard three times. One time when all the lights were off and the blinds were closed, it's on my phone. I heard the footsteps quickly approaching, so I turned my phone off and hid it. Shortly enough, when the footsteps got to the window, they went away as quickly as they came. Another time I did the opposite for the sake of testing. Sat in the corner of my room as far away from the window as possible with all the lights off, blinds down, and only my phone at the lowest brightness. When the footsteps got to my window, it bashed on it three times, then ran away. That part has been persisting for two months at this point. On to the next part. Most recently, I'm talking like last night. Things escalated a little more. Of course, there were the footsteps as well, which I can handle without freaking out at this point. But when I went to sleep after that, I had a nightmare for the first time in many years. I have a fear of clowns, but that's pretty much gone at this point. However, it came back as of last night. So basically, in this nightmare I had, I was in an asylum, and it was completely abandoned and run down with red emergency lights that ran along the hallways. Sort of bathed it in a blood-red tint. As I walked the hallways, I heard a faint sound of jingling bells echo through the hallways. This only made me panic a little more. I quickened my pace until I turned a corner to see a small figure standing at the end of the hallway with a jester hat on its head, bells on each tip. I then quickly sprinted in the opposite direction to cut off numerous times by this small figure. I then decide to hide in one of the cells in hopes that it loses its attention. Then I hear the jingling of the bells and the light but slow footsteps approaching the metal door for the cell I'm hiding in. Me being me, I accidentally swear under my breath from being nervous. The footsteps and jingling stop for a second. Then I hear strong pounding on the door. It finally gives way after the third impact revealing a small clown doll. It then lunges at me, but I smack it to the side and land in some sort of contraption like a paper shredder. I watch as it gets completely decimated, and I continue to search for an exit. As I do, I feel an object in my pocket. It's the clown's head. No matter how many times I throw it away, it always comes back. I then wake up from the nightmare. Everything seems normal until my parents say that they're going on a tour of the asylum. I think nothing of it and think that it would be kind of cool. 
However, as I get to the parking lot of the place, the memories of the previous nightmare come flooding back. I look around for the small clown, but it's nowhere to be seen. As my family and I traverse the halls, they all disappear one by one when I'm not looking. And that's when each family member just gets dimmer and dimmer. The place gets more run down until it looks exactly like my previous nightmare. Everything that proceeds exactly as it had in the nightmare until I'm left hiding in the same cell. But I look for the paper shredder thing that's next to me. It's not there. I then properly wake up this time. I check my phone for the time and it's about 3 a.m. Then as I put my phone down, I hear my door suddenly open only enough so that there's a tiny gap. I quickly rush to get up and close it. Needless to say, the LED... Or, excuse me... Needless to say, the LED lights in my room were coming on after that. With that done, I went back to sleep. This time, no nightmares and no dreams. Curious Knockings Back in 2019, I had moved into a new house with my family and my room in the basement. Me being a teenager, I wasn't complaining being down there. I was just watching YouTube and enjoying the privacy. Well, one day I'm laying in bed watching YouTube when my dog Daisy jumps up, ears like a Doberman, teeth out, hair up, staring at the door growling and barking. Ten seconds later, she abruptly stops whimpers and runs to me. From outside my door I hear three knocks followed by a low guttural growling from the other side of the door. It sounded like a wild animal and to this day I still can't take a guess at what kind of animal. I've heard wolves, bears, dogs, lions growl. It wasn't like any of them. Originally I thought it was my sister who loves to play pranks on me so I get up not thinking anything of it. I swing the door open so I could catch her in the act, but she wasn't there. Now I just think, oh, she's probably hiding somewhere down here. I'll find and scare her back. Checked everywhere. My bathroom, the main basement area, her playroom, even the storage room. Nothing. I knew she hadn't gone upstairs because her stairs are super creaky. She's a heavy walker. There's no way I would have heard her. But still not super suspicious, I put it off and go back to the room and continue what I was doing. About two minutes later, I hear the same three knocks. My dog, now in my bed, is up again, growling with her tail between her legs. At this point, I'm frustrated and swing the door open and nothing again. I walk upstairs, I go outside, and proceed to yell at my sister for trying to play pranks on me. My mom and dad looked at me super confused. My sister swears she never went inside. My parents back her up with a concerned and very serious face. Now I'm generally nervous. My parents are serious people, and I always know when they're joking, and they weren't. I slept upstairs that night. My dog hates it in my room now. She won't sleep unless she's on the bed and waits by the door and cries to get out at night. She's fine in any other room. I got over it eventually, but I still have occurrences every now and then. When home from school, we go inside the garage, and then use the house key to let ourselves in. Well, when I got home that night and tried to let myself in, the key wasn't there. I had to call my sister five times to let me in. I got mad at them for losing it, and they swore that it was there when they got home. They got home an hour before me. I tell my parents about it, and they both search for it for like half an hour, checking the whole garage top to bottom. Didn't find it. Fast forward a day, and my sister said that the key was right back where it belonged in its usual spot. My parents threatened all of us for trying to play pranks on them, and when none of us confessed even after being threatened to be grounded, they got seriously anxious. Just yesterday, my mom heard somebody walking up the steps and woke up to someone in a white sweatshirt just about my height walking around. My second dog, Stella, jumped up, 
and she's old, so she normally takes her time getting up, runs to my mom's side. The thing just walked up the stairs and into the kitchen. She thought it was me, so she didn't panic or anything, but not five minutes later I walked up the stairs for a drink and she got really confused. She asked me if I'd come upstairs already. I answered no and she got super scared. Because I wasn't wearing a white sweatshirt, I was wearing blue. No one else was home. Something is following and targeting me. About 20 years ago, I lived in an apartment. I would hear knocking on the ceiling quite often. I asked the woman across the hall about it, and she replied, Oh, that's just a spirit. It stopped once you moved in. A bit after the knocking started, odd things would happen around the apartment. Things would be moved, windows closed, lights turned off. Things that you would say that I just forgot that I'd really done. Well, one night I looked out of my bedroom. I saw the light from my computer on in the other room. Went in and the screensaver was off. When I went back to my bedroom, I laid down on the bed facing the other room to see if it happened again. It wasn't long before I felt something touch my backside. It was a forceful touch. From that time on, I would wake up with four scratches on each shoulder at least once a week. I switched bedrooms. The scratches stopped. But every time I was going to see my boyfriend, my keys would come up missing. I would find them in the oddest places. Even though I knew that I wouldn't put them in the bathtub, the kitchen cupboards, or my dresser, I brushed it off like I'd just misplaced them myself. My boyfriend stayed over one night, and in the morning, he asked what I'd done to him the previous evening. He showed me his neck. He had four scratches on one side and one on the other. It was as if somebody grabbed his neck with one hand and scratched him. That was the last time that he came over. I soon found out that he was not a good person. I moved out of the apartment into a home with two friends. I took the bungalow bedroom. I could hear somebody running in the attic every night. It stopped once I put a cross over the door. Other odd things did happen. One night we were going to my aunt's home. We were going to get my cousin's Ouija board. I distinctively saw someone in the basement when I was the last one to leave. My roommates also would hear somebody walking around to my bedroom when I wasn't home. A year later I moved into my current home. My cousin moved in with me for a little bit. She would always say that she could hear someone walking up in my bedroom when nobody was home. Nothing much different than the happenings from my apartment happened. Until I met my husband. That's when the traditional haunting things started. Doors closing, things falling, lights flickering, brand new light fixtures breaking. One night when my husband was away and I was working the night shift, I came home to find my back door wide open and the police pulling up. Somebody had used a crowbar to remove a window and rob my home. My neighbor saw them taking things from my home and called the police. Had he not called, I would have walked in on them. Almost exactly one year later, somebody broke into my home again and brutally murdered my husband. Again, I would have been home, but somebody stopped me from going home right then. There's been some small things that have occurred between the two events and many more since. A car was speeding down the road and driving erratically. It would have hit my home, but it hit a tree and changed its course. Two dogs were hit by a speeding car in front of my home. The dog that I currently have was hit by a car. Someone attempted to steal my daughter's car, but the alarm went off well after they were in the car. I had a beautiful Doberman that died of cancer when she was only two years old. Those are just some of the out-of-the-ordinary events that have happened in the past five years. One or two of these events would be normal, but all of them to be the same home in a five-year span? I'm convinced that whatever was in the apartment followed me. 
However, I don't think that it's malevolent. I think that it's protecting me like it did with my boyfriend. What I am convinced of is that there's something very evil in my home. I say this because I would hear a very odd sound from outside. My dog would hear it. One night my camera sent me a notification that it captured the sound. It sent chills up my spine that I told my children not to let any of the dogs out. I did investigate the area the next day. Couldn't find any signs of animals. Can't attach a video with sounds, but I was told by a medium that it sounds like a demon. This same medium told me the next time the light flickers, I should tell it that it's my home and it's not wanted. Shortly after this, my daughter and I were cooking dinner. The lights in the kitchen were flickering for about 20 seconds before going out. Figured they were just burnt out. But I laughed and said, Can you not? This is my home and you don't pay me rent, so unless you start paying, you need to leave my stuff alone. I then walked into the dining room and the lights came right back on. I also have a sleep app that records while I sleep. Many, many times it says that I'm snoring, but it actually sounds like a death rattle on one occasion. I had woken up in the middle of the night and I heard it myself. One of the recordings actually has some other sounds at the very end that's overlapping the rattle. Another recording had me talking in my sleep saying something that's heavy. Then you can hear what sounds like footsteps walking away. Recently, my son moved out of the home. I put my dog's food, water, and crate and toys in the room. The past two days, my dog refuses to go in there. She used to go in there if he was in there. But now it's to the point that I literally have to take her food out of the room or she won't eat. That last story is a doozy.